Hello and welcome back to the VideoLabs Academy. All the lectures we had so far and over 90% of the systems designed in CCTV today consider and work with solid-state single CMOS sensor color cameras. Such cameras are purposely designed for us to see the world through them the same way the human eyes see it. This means some optical and electronic engineering tricks need to be added to the cameras to make them see the visible light in the colors as human eyes see it. And before I go into the main topics of this video lecture titled Special Cameras, I would like to clarify how we see colors with single sensor cameras, which is in a way a special trick on its own. As we already explained in the previous lectures about cameras, the silicon semiconductor material of which CMOS sensors are made are in actual fact sensitive to wider spectrum of wavelengths, not just the visible between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. In fact, the silicon is more sensitive to infrared wavelengths, which we don't see, but in order for the CMOS cameras to see the same as human eye, special infrared cut filters are used. And as we already know, such an infrared cut filter needs to be mechanically removed if the camera is supposed to see at night using infrared illuminators. In addition, the actual visible spectrum is filtered in three RGB bands in order to be interpreted by the RGB display as close as possible to what the human retina cones would. So, how do we actually make a silicon CMOS sensor see colors? As we already explained in the lecture about television, the basic concept of producing colors in television is by combining the three primary colors of red, green and blue. The color mixing actually happens in our eyes when we view the display from a certain distance from which the display RGB pixels are so small that we cannot distinguish. So we actually see the resultant colors produced by the additive mixing of such primary colors small pixels. The most common method of making a single sensor CMOS to be sensitive to various portions of the visible spectrum is by way of grouping four pixels to be responsive to the three primary colors referred to as a Bayer Color Filter Array or CFA, or as some people call it, color mosaic filter. Each of the pixels in the CFA group is sensitive to different range of wavelengths. It should be noted that the light sensitive pixels are of the same silicon structure and are not different material for different colors as some may think. To put it in layman terms, there are no red, green or blue photons, no electrons. It is the CFA mosaic filter that separates the image into color components. So the CFA quadrants have pigment-based optical filters, each of which passes certain portion of the visible light close to the primary colors. Now the filter spectral response is shown in the diagram and as it can be seen from there, one pixel in this group of four is predominantly sensitive to the red colors. The diagonally opposite for that is sensitive uh, the, to the blue colors, while the green color scenes are projected and filtered by the other two diagonally opposite pixels. So the reason for the green uh, being dominant with two pixels out of four in the CFA uh, arrangement, this is simply because the human eye is most sensitive to the green color and the green color actually carries most of the luminance information in an image. Also, there is no other way to divide a group of four pixels in a rectangular arrangement in three primary RGB sections. There are many mathematical transformations when such an RGB signal is mixed into a composite video, which is then ready to be encoded for further processing, compression, transmission and storing. And another important point to make here is that because of the Bayer color mosaic concept, the highest resolution one can see in a composite color image 
produced by a single sensor color imaging uh, CMOS sensor is contained in the green section of the spectrum, which is equivalent to the luminance signal. This resolution is close to the maximum number of horizontal or vertical pixels a sensor has, but the resolution of the red and blue colors are usually half of the luminance components due to the Bayer mosaic arrangement and also due to our eyes being less sensitive to the color resolution compared to the luminance resolution. Basically, cones are far less in the human eye retina than cones and rods combined. One of many functions in processing the RGB components in a color camera is the white balancing. This is simply an algorithm which corrects the white portions of a scene to appear white to the human perception, irrespective of the color temperature of the light source. In the video lecture about color temperatures, I have already explained more about that, so refer to that lecture if you are interested in more details. Using the standard CMOS single sensor color camera, the CCTV industry has created some special cameras. When I say special, I refer to cameras which seem to be different to a typical camera usage, and this is the main topic in this lecture. One of the more popular camera types lately is the so-called fisheye camera, where the sensor is the same as in a typical CMOS camera, but the lens used covers a 180 degree view in the vertical direction, when the camera is mounted in the ceiling, for example, and 360 degrees in the horizontal direction. Such a lens in photography is called a fisheye lens because the image looks like what we think a fish sees the world around it. The difference is in a CCTV, in order to view the scene properly, we use a so-called de-warping software, which straightens or de-warps the distorted view, especially near the edges, and makes the fisheye lens appear normal or natural to us. In fact, to some installers, it seems that a fisheye camera can replace a few fixed cameras looking in different directions from the same point. The main advantage of a fisheye view camera is that it is reasonably cheaper than having four or five fixed cameras looking at east, west, north and south direction and down below to cover the similar area, although with the fisheye lens some lower resolution will appear. Another advantage is when an incident happens about which a shop owner finds out later, he or she can play back the fisheye recording and do the same de-warping during the playback and determine what happened in the incident. This is possible because the fisheye image is recorded as a normal camera signal and as such can be de-warped both as a live video stream or after being recorded and played back. The downsides of such a special camera is that the sensor used is not fully utilized, but rather only the circular image area projected as a fisheye view within the sensor rectangle is used. This means that the details or the pixel density of the objects and people being picked up on the periphery of the fisheye view can never be as good as when the same is seen by a normal lens looking in the direction of the people with a narrower viewing lens. The pixel density of the object, objects near the outskirts of the circular projections are stretched out during the developing and will always be less detailed than in a normal non-dewarped image. Many installers, however, like this special camera as a simple solution to a larger area in a shop or office and promote it as a low-cost solution. There is another, however, next better special camera design, which offers similar 360 degrees coverage as the fisheye, but made up of multiple cameras covering the 360 degree view and arranged in an array of four, six or eight cameras and then a live video stitched at the 25 frames per second. Such cameras cover much better details than the single fisheye cameras and if the live stitching is done well, 
they offer much better details than a single fisheye camera. This is certainly a more expensive solution to a single fisheye camera, but it is more appropriate for larger enclosed areas such as airports, train stations, exhibition halls, because it offers a much larger area of coverage with better details at longer distances. This multifocal sensor camera is the latest in 360 degree technology. It replaces the need for multiple cameras and images can be viewed in real time and played back as if you were viewing a live camera. Another special camera design with the similar concept of live video stitching whereby all cameras and lenses are pointed in a particular direction rather than the all around 360 degrees is the multi-sensor and multifocal panoramic type of camera producing live video assembled of multiple HD, 4K or megapixel cameras installed in one housing with a high quality live video stitching at 25 frames per second. Such a panoramic cameras are primarily intended for viewing large scenes at longer distances. There is no de-warping used here, but rather a very sophisticated live video stitching, which to the operator appears as one large multi-megapixel video scene. The real benefit is being able to digitally zoom in in any area of the stitched video to see details, like faces of spectators in a stadium tribune, across where such cameras are installed. In fact, such a design of multiple stitched sensors offers the real benefit of being able to zoom into the details of the image without having an actual pan till zoom camera. This ultimately means no mechanical wear and tear, which is typical for PTZ cameras. And one more important concept, when such a panoramic camera streams are recorded, they are also stitched on the fly during playback. So the operator can pan, tilt and zoom around the stadium scene, for example, even after the real time event was missed. Needless to say, the viewing stations computers for such a camera requires high performance video graphic acceleration in order to decode and stitch multiple streams as one individual smooth flow. From installation point of view, such a panoramic camera design offers another advantage of easy installation because all separate streams are merged and transmitted on the one network cable be that copper, fiber or wireless. There are many more other special cameras we could list here, which use the same technology of CMOS sensors for the visible light, and in a way, they can also be classified as closed circuit television type, although not necessarily used in surveillance. 
Just to mention a few categories. Pipe inspection cameras, for example, used for water, sewage and other gas pipes inspections. Such cameras typically have their own light and are designed so they have their own mechanism of moving throughout the pipe pathways, often by a rigid cable or also using a little electric vehicle. Endoscopy cameras for inspection of internals of human organs. Such cameras also have some light assembly to illuminate the internal organs and they are very small in diameter so that they easily get inside by way of flexible cables. Body-worn cameras, which are becoming more popular lately as the police is becoming authorized to record during their duty. Drone cameras, which have become very popular and high quality in the last few years. The very impressive thing with drones is the quality of the gimbal stabilization in flight, which adds to the high quality visual images that can be obtained with drones. Smartphone cameras. Obviously, we all have smartphones but we can use them not only as a personal recording devices but there are also more and more VMSs out there which start accepting live video streams from a smartphone for example during a patrol around the secure premises or perhaps as a feed from a place of an incident not covered with static CCTV cameras. In addition to the previously listed special cameras using the normal imaging sensors as an element I would like to also mention some other special cameras which use the invisible portions of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. Such cameras include low light intensified cameras which are designed to pick up very low photon energies and amplify them by way of active electronic amplification, typically used in military or hunting. Thermal cameras which are designed to pick up infrared wavelengths. Ultraviolet cameras, which are designed to pick up UV wavelengths. Terahertz cameras, which are designed to pick up even longer wavelengths than thermal, designed to see through clothing, used most often at customs at airports, where explosive and plastic knives cannot be picked up by a metal detector. X-ray camera sensors, which are designed to pick up X-ray radiation, like when inspecting luggage bags at the airport or used in dental surgeries, for example. And finally, LIDARs, or light detection and ranging cameras, used on some autonomous vehicles and for automatic phase detection. I will try and cover each one of these briefly and separately. Now about low light and intensified cameras. Modern imaging sensors can see in as low light as human eyes can see. Certainly, this can be further improved by using Extreme Automatic Gain Control, or AGC, although this will increase the noise. Most important factor in how good a camera can see in low light, as already explained under the minimum illumination lectures, is the pixel size. The visible levels of illumination from 100,000 luxes down to 0.1 of a lux, as also already explained previously, is called photopic vision area. Sometimes, however, there is a need for even lower light level camera in light lower than 0.1 of a lux, and this area is called scotopic vision area. If we want to see motion in the scotopic vision area, a special type of camera called intensified or low light level camera can be used. Intensified cameras have an additional element called a light intensifier, which is installed between the lens and the camera sensor. The light intensifier is basically an imaging element that converts the very faint light to a light level that can be seen by the imaging sensor. The amplification is done by an avalanche effect of the electrons which light photons produce when attracted to a high voltage static field. The resultant electrons hit the phosphor coating at the end of the intensifier tube, causing the phosphor to glow, thus producing visible light, which is in the same manner as when an electron beam produces light onto a cathode ray tube, CRT, in the old, olden days of analog CCTV monitors. Because of the very specific infrared wavelengths of low light levels, 
as well as the monochrome phosphor coating of the intensifier, the low light level cameras will only display monochrome images. It is to be expected that having a phosphor coating inside an intensifier, the lifetime, or more correctly, the MTBF, or mean time between failure, of an intensifier tube is short. It is usually in the vicinity of a couple of thousand of hours. Now, although the CMOS technology is now prevailing for the photopic vision, the older CCD technology is used by yet another uh, invention called EMCCD. The EMCCD stands for Electron Multiplying Back Thin Frame Transfer CCD Sensor. And often pixel sizes in these sensors are larger than 12 micrometers by 12 micrometers. This is as a square area 144 square micrometers which compared to a typical CCTV CMOS camera pixel with only 4 square micrometers is a big difference. The manufacturers claim that EMCCD revolutionizes low-light imaging with on-chip amplification. With the large pixels and back thin sensitivity amplification, the EMCCD cameras are very attractive choice for extremely low light and low background applications. The latest development, however, in some very special sensor technologies achieve even better utilization of very low light photon uh, amounts, aggregating the visible and near infrared spectrum wavelengths. Not only they pick up much better than any previous technology, but they also produce a color video in the scotopic spectrum area. Such a camera is X27 by SPI, developed for special reconnaissance purposes. The X27 is the highest performing, most sensitive, color night vision camera available. There's nothing else like it. Tonight, we're going to have a side-by-side -side shootout, putting the X27 against the other leading low-light technologies. For this shootout, we'll compare visible versus non-visible lasers. See what the difference is with the X27 versus the other low-light technologies. A lot of current technologies can visualize infrared and visible lasers. Take a look at this image. See the purple one? That's IR. Red one? That's visible laser. Nothing else does this like the X27. With the PVS-14, distinguishing these lasers is impossible. In black and white, there is no color. And here's the side-by-side -side to prove it. Swear is seeing no lasers. EMCCD is grainy, noisy, and just overall tough to see. Thermal technology is simply incapable of seeing these lasers. Here's the UAV demo. We've attached a tiny IR beacon to a drone that's going to be flying by. Let's see what the X27 picks up versus the other guys. Here we're seeing the structure of the UAV, its lights, and the IR beacon, all in full color HD. Can you tell which popular UAV this is? With PVS-14, I can detect something up there, but certainly can't recognize what it is. Again, there's definitely something there, but no way to recognize what it is. Which image would you prefer? Swear is seeing no UAVs. There's lots of noise here, lots of blooming. Honestly, makes me hungry for a donut. Clearly, this is a great image but no color and no IR beacon. Now in this shootout, we've attached tiny IR beacons to some of our teammates hiding out in the desert. Let's see what we see with the X27 versus other low light technologies. The X27 can see invisible IR beacons in full HD color with no bloom. PVS-14 just falls short by comparison. With low-light CMOS, 
Again, it sees the beacon, but no color. Swear is not going to help you see any IR beacons. With EMCCD, again, it's grainy and there's quite a bit of blooming. And thermal is simply not designed to see infrared beacons. In the human identification shootout, we've got some guys down in the field, and we're gonna see what the X-27 sees versus the other guys. A lot of current technology can help provide detection and recognition, but for identification, our brains crave color. That's what you gain with the X-27. With PVS-14, detection, sure. Recognition, somewhat, but very little contrast. With CMOS, it's not as clear, not as bright, and without the color, facial recognition becomes very tough. Side by side with the X-27, the difference is clear. Swear is just a, a waste and a mess. EMCCD has some color, but it's just too grainy and too much noise to be useful. Now with thermal, we know it's impossible to hide, but identification is where the challenge is. Now in the colored laser shootout, we'll fire lasers downrange and see what we see with the X-27 versus the other low light technologies. Here's our X-27 bright, crisp, clear colors. You've got green, red, blue, clearly. And with PVS-14, again, you lose that color and all that clarity that the X-27 has. With the leading competitor, CMOS, watch what happens when the laser reflects back to the sensor. Boom, right there, your image goes dark. Now that's not gonna happen with the rugged X-27 that has the dynamic range to deliver rock-solid imaging in even the most challenging conditions. Next up is SWEAR, and really nothing much to say here. With the MCCD, again, you do have some disparity in color, but it's just a big, noisy mess. And we love thermal, but it just doesn't see what our X-27 sees. Okay, next, thermal imaging cameras. There are cameras designed to pick up wavelengths in the infrared region called thermal imaging cameras. The thermal infrared spectrum lays between visible light and microwaves on the electromagnetic spectrum and covers a range of wavelengths between 8 and 15 micrometers. Such cameras do not use the normal CMOS imaging sensor, but rather a sensor called microbolometer. They can see the thermal spectrum of the viewed image and they can detect a variation in temperature of as low as 0.05 degree. And it does not require cooling to work accurately. Due to the wavelengths of sensing they work at, they have relatively large but small number of pixels. Typically 320 by 240, although 640 by 480 and even higher number of pixel count are becoming uh, more common. This translates to a pixel size of typically 45 micrometers in older devices and it has been decreased down to 17 micrometers in current devices which don't forget you can always compare them with our 2 micrometers for a typical CCTV camera CMOS sensor. The visual highlighting of the temperature difference is the most important tool in the usage of the thermal imaging cameras. Typically hotter areas are shown in red and colder in blue with the temperature variations between these extremes changing through yellow and green. Thermal imaging cameras can be used to detect intruders in total darkness, for example, without having to use infrared illuminators. More importantly, thermal imaging cameras can see in total darkness, but also through fog and rain. Firefighters use thermal imaging cameras to see the various temperatures in the fire. Also, when analyzing an engine, for example, the hotter parts can easily be picked up by a thermal imaging camera. Electrical installation and fuse boxes can be checked for excessive 
cut and draw with thermal imaging cameras. The video output format of a thermal imaging camera can be in the form of a motion JPEG or H.264 stream and as such can be digitally recorded as a normal video signal. Some manufacturers even put two cameras on one pan and tilt head, for example, both looking in the same direction, one thermal and the other standard camera, so that when monitoring or surveying an area, both types of video streams are available. A new type of a very small thermal sensor is so-called lepton design. The FLIR lepton design is a radiometric capable LWIR camera solution that is smaller than 10 millimeters, fits inside a smartphone and is one tenth of the cost of traditional infrared cameras. There are also ultraviolet cameras. The ultraviolet spectrum lays between X-rays and visible light on the electromagnetic spectrum and covers a range of wavelengths between 100 nanometers and 400 nanometers. There are imaging sensors which are modified to pick up UV wavelengths and convert them to visible spectrum. And such camera functions as UV light detector. Long-term exposure to certain wavelengths within this spectrum can cause a variety of problems from skin conditions such as melanoma up to eye conditions such as cataract and eye macular degeneration. UV cameras can be useful in detecting some skin conditions in medicine floral inspections, but also high voltage power lines corona inspections. Namely, power lines have a damaging effect of high voltage corona, which is often invisible to human eyes. In order to find such a location in the high voltage power lines, UV cameras are used. The next type of special cameras are the so-called T-ray or terahertz cameras. The electromagnetic spectrum of longer wavelengths than the infrared frequencies, but higher than the radio waves, which sits between 300 gigahertz and 3 terahertz, which is equivalent to millimeter wavelength band, is the spectrum in which T-ray cameras and sensors operate in. This is reasonably new technology, which is becoming more popular as sensors are getting smaller and more affordable. The main beauty of the T-ray camera sensors is that they are non-invasive, but penetrate through obstacles like paper, cotton boxes and clothing. Its main application at this stage is in airport customs control, where potential threats of plastic explosive or non-metallic objects worn by people can easily and quickly be detected without using the invasive X-ray radiation. X-ray cameras can also be classified as a special type of camera. Although X-ray cameras are not very known in the CCTV, but in order to be complete when discussing special cameras in this lecture, I need to mention them too. The X-ray cameras are in fact sensors which pick up X-ray radiation coming from an X-ray source. So instead of having a film which needs to be developed after being exposed to X-ray, like we have done when we had dental inspection, for example, we can now have a camera sensor that picks up the X-ray radiation and immediately shows it as an electronic image signal. Such cameras are also used in labs for various research and in astronomy. Last but not least, let's say a couple of words about the LiDAR cameras. LiDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. It is a remote sensing method that uses light in the form of a pulsed laser to measure distances. These light pulses, combined with other data recorded by an airborne system, for example, generate precise three-dimensional information about the distance and shape of objects around by way of so-called points cloud. Although strictly speaking LiDARs are not cameras as such, but they do act like one and can produce visual images which indicates various distances from the point of view of the device. 
Because LiDAR uses infrared laser light, like in the 3D laser scanners in survey applications, it achieves high precision of measuring distances with very small powers. LiDAR has become popular in modern autonomous self-driving cars when navigating, but also in drones, which use LiDAR cameras to map and measure terrain below them. In a way, modern face unlocking technology on some smartphones uses a similar concept whereby a mesh of over 30,000 infrared spotlights are projected on your face and detected with an infrared sensor, creating a 3D mesh of your face with accurate dimensions. This actually helps in unlocking the phones at night, at low light, when the actual camera may not be able to see.